This is Aldous Huxley, a man haunted by a vision of hell on earth. A searing social critic, Mr. Huxley, 27 years ago, wrote Brave New World, a novel that predicted that someday the entire world would live under a frightful dictatorship. Today, Mr. Huxley says that his fictional world of horror is probably just around the corner for all of us. We'll find out why in a moment. Why is it that the right people will not, in your estimation, use them? Why is it that the wrong people will use these various devices and for the wrong motives? Well, I think one of the, uh, of the reasons is that uh, these are all instruments for uh, obtaining power, and obviously the passion for power is one of the most moving passions that exist in man, and uh, after all, this is all democracies are based on the proposition that power is very dangerous and that it's uh, extremely important not to let any one man or any one small group have too much power for too long a time. After what are the British and American constitutions except devices for limiting power? And all these uh, new devices are extremely efficient instruments for the imposition of power by small groups over larger masses. You probably read a book by White, The Organization Man, a very interesting, valuable book, I think, where he speaks about the new type of group morality, group ethic, which uh, speaks about the group as though the group were somehow more important than the individual. But uh, this seems, as far as I'm concerned, to be uh, in contradiction with uh, what we know about the genetical makeup of human beings, that every human being is unique. And it is, of course, on this... Uh, genetical basis that the whole idea of the value of freedom is based and I think it's extremely important for us to uh, stress this in all our educational life and I would say it's also very important to teach people to be on their guard against the sort of verbal booby traps into which they're always being led uh, to, to analyze the kind of things that are said to them. I ended my last video with the suggestion that Bill Gates could have been conspiring with Jeffrey Epstein over their shared interest in eugenics, and even perhaps that the high-stakes nature of the Darwinian game of genomes could point towards Bill as the prime suspect in Epstein's mysterious and alleged death. Today's video is going to look deeper into their connections which is something that I hope that people with more resources than me are also doing. Because if the video on gene drives had you worried, this video should both reinforce that and unleash an all new level of existential horror on your mind. First, we need to briefly cover what was talked about in the last video, which was the combination of CRISPR, a method of fast and inexpensive genetic engineering which became part of the scientific body in 2012. Since then, genetic engineering has proliferated rapidly and in all directions, reaching even high school levels. Authority can't keep up. It's just too slow. So we've been trying to do the stopgap measures. We've been first trying to let all the scientists know about the danger. I spent, I spent a lot of time talking to iGEM which is an international genetically engineered machines competition, a bunch of talented undergrads and even high school students who play about with genetically engineered organisms. Very important that they understand that they should not insert the CRISPR system and instructions for targeting it into the same place that it targets. Because you do that in a sexually reproducing organism, you just made a CRISPR gene drive, boom, gone. Now, yes, you run the risk that someone, one of them is gonna do this deliberately, Eventually that's gonna happen. We have to push it off for long enough so that we can do some good with the technology first. A gene drive is a method of altering a gene so that it is inherited at a greater than natural rate. In its simplest form, this is a 100% transference of the imposed gene. Thus, a CRISPR gene drive combines these two technologies to enable the creation of a gene sequences which have the potential to make a species extinct. Most organisms have two copies of every given gene. And if they're different, each of them has a 50% chance of being inherited by offspring. So the way a lot of gene drives work is that they can distort inheritance so that they're more likely to end up in any offspring that occur. And that's interesting because normally 
when we engineer an organism, no matter how we do it, through selective breeding like dogs, or through now we have CRISPR that lets us precisely edit essentially any DNA sequence we want in the genome of almost any organism. Either way, we're tinkering with something that evolved over many, many, many generations to optimize reproduction in its ancestral habitat. Meaning you mess with it in any way, put it back in that habitat, and we've almost certainly broken it in some way. And the upshot of that is we can't engineer things, put them in the wild and have them stick around. Natural selection beats us. But with a gene drive, if it's more than, if it's more likely than normal to be inherited, it can decrease the fitness of the organism and still spread in a population. So a brilliant scientist by the name of Austin Burt, who had studied one particular form of gene drive that exists in the wild, thought, hey, if we could just engineer these proteins called nucleases to cut sequences that we wanted, we could use this to engineer wild populations. But the idea is every potential DNA sequence has an intrinsic fitness. That is, how good is it at replicating itself in the environment it's currently in? And if you envision all possible DNA sequences, all the mutants surrounding it, they have an associated fitness. So if you think of this in three dimensions, it creates a mountain range. And you can think of populations as being clusters of sequences. And the ones that are higher up out replicate the earlier, the ones that are lower down. And so the population slowly climbs to the highest point of the fitness peak. So if we can control the fitness landscape, we can control how an incredibly complex system, because there's no way we could engineer a dog from scratch, right? That is immensely far beyond our capabilities. We can't even engineer an individual protein to do what we want as well as nature can. But what we can do is control evolution so that the system evolves to create some sort of tool that is useful to us, no matter how complex. These clips you will be seeing today come from a YouTube channel operated by a recently resigned director of research at MIT by the name of Joy Ito, who works at the Harvard Wiss Evolutionary Biology Lab, where he received funding from both our boy Bill Gates and our man Jeffrey Epstein. Wired Magazine says that when he was interviewed for Wired Magazine, Barack Obama requested that Joy Ito be the one to interview him. This is actually the second confirmation I've seen that Wired began as a propaganda arm of the MIT Media Lab. But you can see here that Nicholas Negroponte was one of the founding financiers. And it's kind of interesting because I, I love Nicholas. I, I have dinner with him a couple times a month. And... and now that we're here, let's move on to that. After his 2013 conviction and lenient sentencing, Epstein had a personal office at the Harvard Wiss Evolutionary Biology Lab where he provided ample funding. Just how much funding is up for a lot of question. Bill Gates, too, funded the same director at the same lab, albeit anonymously. He didn't want his name associated with the donation, unlike so many of his other donations. It also was not part of his typical uh, philanthropic funding through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Sources cited by this New Yorker article say that it was understood that the Gates Foundation funding was Epstein money. Quote the New Yorker, The documents and sources suggest that there was more to the story. They show that the lab was aware of Epstein's history. In 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to state charges of solicitation of prostitution and procurement of minors for prostitution and of his disqualified status as a donor. They also show that Ito and other lab employees took numerous steps to keep Epstein's name from being associated with the donations he made or solicited. On Ito's calendar, which typically listed the full names of participants in meetings, Epstein was identified only by his initials. Epstein's direct contributions to the lab were recorded as anonymous. In September 2014, Ito wrote to Epstein, soliciting a cash infusion to fund a certain researchers, asking, Could you re-up, top off another $100,000 so that we can extend his contract another year? Epstein replied, Yes. Forwarding the response to a member of the staff, Ito wrote, Make sure this gets accounted for as anonymous. 
Peter Cohen, the MIT Media Lab's Director of Development and Strategy at the time, reiterated, Jeffrey Money needs to be anonymous. Thanks. However, an internal investigation at MIT found that the money was not laundered through Epstein. Notably, we did not find any evidence that the money donated by Gates or Black actually was Epstein's money. Their denial seems to be more on the level of Snopes fact-checking. It's more of a technicality than the truth. Quote Yahoo Finance on the matter. Friday's report by independent law firm Goodwin Proctor said Epstein claimed to have arranged for Gates to give $2 million and for Black to give $5 million to the media lab. Representatives of both denied the claim. That is, there is no evidence that Gates and Black acted to launder Epstein's money, the investigators wrote. The donations were all sought by Lloyd or former Media Lab director Joy Ito, who has since resigned, the report said. In the Axios article, The Anatomy of Bill Gates, Jeffrey Epstein's Facilitated MIT Donations, we can read the original letter showing the unusually covert nature of this donation being made anonymously and not through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The letter reads, quote, November 7, 2014, to Joy Ito, Director, MIT Media Lab, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dear Joy, in appreciation of the work being done at the MIT Media Lab, William H. Gates III is providing a $2 million unrestricted gift for your continued research at the MIT Media Lab. Please note that Bill wishes to remain anonymous with this contribution. Sincerely, Larry M. Cohen, agent for William H. Gates III. Again, the conversation we've been watching clips of is Joy Ito, the Gates and Epstein-funded research director at the lab where Epstein had an office. You know, at what point is this informed consent, right? How, how much do they really understand what's going on? And how much are they going to turn around and blame you if something goes bad by saying you didn't explain it well is one piece. And then also, you know, where's the government in all of this? Um, the regulators are probably not able to keep up with all of this. And I, I, the reason we love you and we wanted you to join the Media Lab was that of all the scientists who work on this stuff, I, I think you're the only one at this level who is thinking about the deployment uh, risks and structures and, and informed consent and everything that we talked about um, and the safety stuff. The world-changing discovery of gene drives was made by a man named Kevin Esveldt at the MIT Media Lab where Ito was the research director. Kevin Esveldt, the creator of the gene drive technology, just so happens to be the other party in the conversation we have been watching, where the genocidal devices gene drives are literally referred to as child's play in comparison to other advances too dangerous to even speak about. The strong version of the precautionary principle says don't do anything until you can understand all of the consequences. And that's fine as long as you get to stay where you are if you do nothing. But that's not the world we live in. It might seem that way to some people, but that's not the world we live in. Civilization is not sustainable. We need continued invention. We need new technologies because otherwise we're eroding our natural resource base and we have to invent our way out of it. There's no other choice. We've passed the point of no return. There's too many people. We need to be more efficient. We need new technologies and they have to be ever more powerful, but that's a double-edged sword. How do you ensure that we use them wisely? How do you ensure that we don't accidentally open a technological box that destroys us all? They're out there. There are some in biology. I'm not gonna talk about it further, but they're out there. There are also some countermeasures that people are working on that will hopefully ensure that those boxes stay closed and eliminate those risks. But how many more are out there that we haven't seen? How many are out there in other fields? I mean, people are very aware of this in AI as a potential risk. People are very aware of this when it comes to nuclear weapons. How many other things are out there that we just, that no one has thought of? What these are, I can hardly speculate. They likely utilize CRISPR in some form and maybe some sort of a gene drive or an alteration on that mechanism, perhaps transmitted via an adenovirus or an adeno-associated virus. But I fear that the real answer is likely much worse. 
we believe, anyway, that we live in democracy here in the United States. Do you believe that this brave new world that you talk about uh, could, let's say, in the next quarter century, the next century, could come here to our shores? I think it could. I mean, I, I, that's why I feel it's so extremely important here and now to start thinking about these problems, not to let ourselves themselves be taken by surprise by the uh, new advances in technology. I mean, the, for example, in, in regard to the use of the, of the drugs, we know there's enough evidence now uh, for us to be able, on the basis of this evidence and using a certain amount of creative imagination, to foresee the kind of uses which could be made in a, uh, by people of bad will with these things uh, and to attempt to to forestall this, and in the same way, I think with these other methods of uh, propaganda, we can foresee and we can do a good deal to forestall. I mean, after all, the, um, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. These biologists, despite literally playing God, may not even be collaborators in any nefarious research, not part of any eugenicist plot. Well, to be fair, they, they are part of several eugenicist plots, just not specifically any against humans that we know of. But Epstein's interest in their research is enough evidence to raise significant concern, especially considering the veritable parade of biologists that Epstein was funding. The New York Times reports, as well as multiple sources over different periods, recount Epstein's conversations on his breeding program aspirations. As the last video explored, CRISPR and gene drives allow a covert means to make a Darwinian conquest on the scale of Genghis Khan or, indeed, total, spreading across the entire human species. On this point, several paradigms converge, Darwinian and eugenicist perspectives, narcissistic and egotistic perspectives, even the biological imperative. If some new dominant genome was going to exterminate yours, simply off the premise that the technology does exist and you're among the first with access to it, would it not be only moral and ethical to act first? Is it not, after all, the goal of Darwinian evolution, a cold and brutal process that has killed endless trillions of creatures? Imagine, after billions of years of life, you alone come out on top. Another interesting and concerning Epstein connection is also close at hand. Kevin Esvelt's early work was with Dr. George Church, famed geneticist, founder of the Human Genome Project, and genetic curator for NIST. So the first half will be towards the beginning where I talk about s reading DNA, because reading and writing DNA are very he heavily in interconnected. And the second point where we're talking about uh, humans 2.0, um, I'll mention it. He allegedly wants to create a fully synthetic human genome. George Church was a lead researcher on the team that first used CRISPR to edit human DNA, and Kevin Esvelt and George Church built the first gene drive together. Is there a chance that this gene therapy is going to extend my life, or is it only for people being born now? Uh, oh yeah, I think, well, we have demonstrations in animals of aging reversal. So you can see a, a wide variety of biomarkers uh, where you can get blood vessel, skeletal, cardiac muscle, and so forth that actually is Give them to me. Yeah. It's not, Can you really bring back the... It has to go through a process. Oh, okay, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have to cut a check of that, right? <laughs> it's who you know. That's how you that's live right, forever. Right. It's who you know. Yeah, yeah. Right, now, now I know why I'm on can, the show. Can yeah, you right. bring back the woolly mammoth? Because I would love to see one. Uh, I'd love a woolly steak. So how did I get a... Can we get one? Yeah. <laughs> We've, we can read the woolly mammoth genome, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. These things have been extinct for a long time. We can read this ancient DNA, and we can now write it, can edit the elephant genomes with CRISPR again. And we've done this. We've made 15 edits so far of bringing back the extinct DNA. Please grow one and bring it back on the show. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be fun. That's wanna, serious yeah. ratings. Wanna, <laughs> That's serious ratings. Okay. Oh. Thank you yeah. so much. Also, the Wolverine Claws. I'm up yeah. for those two. Thank yeah. you for being yeah. here. Yeah. Um, George Church, everyone. We're all going to live forever. We'll be right back. 
But this brings us to the link which I am forming to bind this chain together. Bill Gates. Once again, we find that in 2015, Bill Gates put $120 million into a company founded by Dr. George Church, which would seek to alter the human genome. To really reinforce this bond I'm forging, Dr. Boris Nikolic, the former science advisor for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, was the managing director for the $120 million investment. Boris Nikolic is the man here on the far right on Epstein's Island with Bill, or uh, I, I may be mistaken on this. This might be um, Epstein's mansion because there's denial that Bill Gates... Um, the Bill Gates ever went to his island. And when Jeffrey Epstein died, Dr. Boris Nikolic was named as one of his executors in a will that was written only two days before Epstein killed himself. A role Nikolic apparently tried to distance himself from. Jeff's brother put up his condo to cover Jeff's bail after his first arrest, but maybe, uh, maybe Jeff was too embarrassed that his brother would go to his island and find his porn stash and his weird sex toys. There's a third billionaire involved, Leon Black. For the sake of keeping this simple, I will exclude him, mainly, from this video. However, it's all over the mainstream media if you care to find out more. To keep it basic as possible, I will refer to the report concerning Jeffrey E. Epstein's connections to Harvard University. That's the Harvard University report on the Epstein donations. To keep it short and summarize... Jeffrey Epstein used to donate millions to Harvard's Program for Evolutionary Dynamics, mainly toward the work of a Professor Martin Nowak, a man whose research also frequently receives Bill Gates funding. Sometimes they both fund the same project. Epstein's donations paid for a second lab for the Program for Evolutionary Dynamics in an office building leased from a private owner. And I've only just now realized what an ironic acronym PED would be for a eugenics program, seeing as it's shorthand for performance-enhancing drugs in sports parlance. Anyway, after Epstein's 2008 conviction, Harvard's president decided to stop accepting Epstein's donations. However, Harvard found that Epstein was using other philanthropists to funnel money to Martin Nowak from 2010 to 2015. These donations amounted to nearly $10 million and perhaps much more. While the Harvard Crimson reported a $30 million pledge from Epstein, Harvard themselves have no record of such a donation. Perhaps the most telling evidence of Epstein's motives can be found in his reapplication to a Harvard fellowship he was severely underqualified for. Don't worry about the jargon. It, it appears to be social theory infiltrating science, and uh, social prosthetic theory is the pet research of the man who got Epstein in the door, and it seems to be mainly pandering. Although there are indications that Epstein came to adopt and utilize some aspects of the theory that a perceptive viewer will infer from the following. In Jeffrey Epstein's own words, My studies are not complete as I am working on the intersection between evolutionary dynamics, social statistical mechanics, game theory, computational biology, and synthetic biology, in an attempt to discover the mathematical underpinnings of competition versus cooperation. Included in this is an attempt to formularize the efficiencies of social prosthetic systems. First attempts have been to analogize it to heat and energy transference across variable resistance nodal networks. I am further attempting to find a derivation of power. Why does everybody want it? In an ecological social system that would include variables for reputation, trust or awe, and the inherent strategically diverse tactics of deception. The application was approved. However, after charges were first brought up against Epstein in 2006, his status was brought up in a meeting whose records are largely unavailable, except some notes referring to Epstein and his donations. But, as Harvard's investigation showed, Epstein's money kept coming simply via other means. When Epstein went back to jail, we all knew he'd die before trial. 
too many powerful people had it out for him. We are all familiar with his first attempted suicide which landed him on suicide watch and the odd circumstances surrounding the time of his death. I was not aware, however, that he had written a new will only two days before his apparent suicide. I had to make sure that it was widely reported before I could really believe it. The lawyer for Mexican drug lord El Chapo Guzman was the witness. With Bill's employee named Epstein's executor, who knows what loose ends might have been tied up. This move would give the vulnerable parties plenty of time to initiate a cover-up to hide the evidence. In totally unrelated news, $50,000 in concrete was shipped to Epstein's island shortly before his arrest. Other than Epstein and his apparent will to power, all the other people we've been talking about Bill Gates, George Church, Joy Ito, Kevin Esvelt, they don't need to be evil villains for this to be true. They only need to convince themselves that they are making the right choice for the greater good. With Bill Gates, this motivation is easy to find. Well, issues related to population, reducing the population growth, uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Now uh, that's back from high school algebra, but let's, let's take a look. Uh, first, we've got population. George Church has aspirations of bringing Neanderthals back to life and resurrecting the woolly mammoth, and supported the secret human gene editing program, which saw CRISPR being used to alter the genes of Chinese infants to make them resistant to HIV. To reiterate, George Church played a leading role in the creation of CRISPR and the creation of the gene drive. In a question and answer on the topic, he was asked, But there are relatively low rates of HIV infection in Chinese women. This isn't like in, say, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, where the medical need to protect young women from the virus is great. George Church's answer, This was a stretch. There is no doubt about it. There could be a bunch of small risks. Quite clearly, the major motivator was testing CRISPR. Question. What do you think of the criticism that the experiment doesn't address an unmet medical need? Answer. The unmet medical need is that there's no cure or vaccination for HIV. And in that sense, there's more of a medical need than there is for beta thalassemia, for which there is an alternative, unless both parents are homozygous. If both parents have two copies of the mutant gene, all of their offspring will develop the disease. This last statement is very vague, but from what I've researched, the method to prevent HIV in these uh, children that were augmented with CRISPR was to cripple the beta thalassemia gene. When both parents have this crippled gene, the child will have an illness similar to sickle cell, and the only cure for beta thalassemia disease is a risky stem cell transplant procedure that is only chanced in the very worst cases. From these statements, we can see that George Church sees testing CRISPR, the tool that he helped create, as being more important than the medical necessity or outcomes. It's a fascinating interview, which in its whole demonstrates an amazing dismissal of known and observed negative effects. Again, the interview goes into more detail on his views and is a worthwhile read for anyone interested in the prevailing views on ethics in genomic engineering. This is part of our efforts to reverse aging in humans. So I've been involved for over a decade with companies in China. People look to George Church. He's got gravitational pull in the genomics field. There's kind of this public world and then there's what's actually happening. Is something I'm going to do or is something I'm going to sell going to hurt somebody? I've, I've never thought about it. Anybody can use gene editing. I've been here for a week and I found three people editing human embryos. There's a cover-up. Babies whose like, genomes have been mutated as part of the international science race. And when you press publish, you can't take it back. 
Chinese researcher has created an international controversy over the world's first genetically edited babies. Named Lulu and Nana. Your story forced a conversation. The accusation now is that you've broken the law. I don't need credit for it, but I do need to be first. As human beings, have never been able to decide what genes we get. For this person, it's not dystopia. That's utopia. So the biggest issue is just how quickly this technology is evolving. It is breathtaking. This is not the end of the story either. I would like to quote the MIT Technology Review, but it's too much to read. So to summarize, Joy Ito admitted that he had taken Epstein money both uh, by the Media Lab and his own private ventures. In September 2019, Ito held a meeting to discuss uh, the issue, which began with a guided breathing exercise where Ito suggested that restorative justice indicated that he shouldn't resign, but should stay in his role to assist in the healing process. What a great guy. Quote the MIT Technology Review, Ito's disclosures led to the resignation of both Ethan Zuckerman, a well-known technology activist who ran the Media Lab's Center for Civic Media, who said that he had urged Ito in 2014 not to meet with Epstein and Media Lab visiting scholar J. Nathan Mattias. This was the moment when a former research director at the lab by the name of Nicholas Negroponte decided to intervene. And it's kind of interesting, because I, I love Nicholas. I, I have dinner with him a couple times a month. And... Now, this is pretty funny stuff. I feel like we've come full circle and gone peak SJW with this one. The following is a direct quote from the MIT Technology Review. It's quite long, but hey, I never expected MIT to write the following. The meeting had proceeded calmly, but as one of the organizers began to wrap things up, Negroponte stood up unprompted and began to speak. He discussed his privilege as a rich white man and how he had used that privilege to break into the social circles of billionaires. It was these connections, he said, that had, had allowed the Media Lab to be the only place at MIT that could afford to charge no tuition, pay people full salaries, and allow researchers to keep their intellectual property. Negroponte said that he prided himself on knowing over 80% of the billionaires in the US on a first name basis, and that through these circles he had come to spend time with Epstein. Over the years, he had two dinners and one ride in Epstein's private jet alone, where they spoke passionately about science. He didn't say whether these occurred before or after Epstein's 2008 conviction. It was these interactions, he said, that warmed him to Epstein and made him confidently and enthusiastically recommend that Ito take the money. It was at this point that Negroponte said that he would still have given the same advice to Ito today. Different people in attendance had conflicting interpretations of his statement. Some understood him to mean that he would act in the same way even knowing what he knows about Epstein's alleged sex trafficking. But Negroponte told the Boston Globe that in retrospect, yes, we are embarrassed and regret taking his money. The comments clearly stunned some of his listeners. A woman in the front row began crying. Kate Darling, a research scientist at the MIT Media Lab, shouted, Nicholas, shut up. Negroponte responded that he would not shut up and that he had founded the lab, to which Darling said, we've been cleaning up your messes for the past eight years. Zuckerman, who had spoken earlier in the meeting, also had a brief spat with Negroponte. Negroponte pressed on. In the fundraising world, he said, these types of occurrences were not out of the ordinary, and they shouldn't be reason enough to cut off business relationships. It wasn't until Darling yelled, shut up again, that Negroponte mumbled, good grief, and sat down. Soon after, the meeting disbanded. 
Details of this article have been edited to downplay Negroponte's comments. I was going to find the original page, but this URL has been excluded from the Wayback Machine. Looks like Winston Smith is hard at work filing away history in the furnaces. And yet, we carry on. As per Axios reporting, LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman apologizes for role in Epstein linked donations to MIT. Quote, Hoffman invited both former MIT lab director Joy Ito and Epstein to an August 2015 dinner in Palo Alto with Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and Peter Thiel. He tells Axios that he invited Epstein at Ito's behest, and only because Ito vouched for the convicted criminal, saying that he had successfully cleared MIT's vetting process. Hoffman funded the Media Lab's Disobedience Award, given to individuals and groups who engage in responsible, ethical disobedience aimed at challenging norms, rules, or laws that sustain society's injustices. Last year, the award went to Me Too leaders. The Disobedience Award takes the form of a glass orb fabricated by star MIT professor Neri Oxman. Hoffman received a similar orb, so did Epstein. Sources say that Oxman, who did not respond to requests for comment, received a significant amount of MIT's Epstein-linked money. At this point, are you even shocked to find out that Jeffrey Epstein's cabal had palantirs? Questioning authority and thinking for yourself is an essential component of science, of civil rights, of society. At some level, disobedience is at the root of a lot of this creativity. Would an artist be eligible? Where absolutely. I think whether it's art, science, culture, politics, I think all of those domains are eligible. How did you guys come up with this idea? The Media Lab use its position as to really help those inventors, those oddballs, those eccentrics, help create the future that we all want to be in. If the current system is not working for them, then uh, sparks fly. We're in the age of rebellion now. Uh, this is the age of rebellion. Yeah, I believe the future is worth fighting for, and I believe you get the future that you fight for eventually. And the Epstein connections go on and on from The Verge. AI pioneer accused of having sex with trafficking victim on Jeffrey Epstein's island. A victim of billionaire Jeffrey Epstein testified that she was forced to have sex with MIT professor Marvin Minsky, as revealed in a newly unsealed deposition. Minsky, who died in 2016, was known as an associate of Epstein. But this is the first direct accusation implicating the AI pioneer in Epstein's broader sex trafficking network. Wow, how many MIT professors are getting paid and getting laid with Jeffrey Epstein? And yet, as we've seen, there are bigger odds at stake than money and perhaps even safety. Remember back to Epstein's application where he views the desire for power as an inherent trait in people. Why is it that the right people will not, in your estimation, use them? Why is it that the wrong people will use these various devices and for the wrong motives? Well, I think one of the, uh, of the reasons is that uh, these are all instruments for uh, obtaining power, and obviously the passion for power is one of the most moving passions that exist in man and is, after all this is all democracies are based on the proposition that power is very dangerous and that it's uh, extremely important not to let any one man or any one small group have too much power for too long a time after what are the British and American constitutions except devices for limiting power and all these uh, new devices are extremely efficient instruments for the imposition of power by small groups over larger masses. From this point of view, propagation of power would be more important than morality. 
This is an ethos proposed by infamous YouTube neurologist J.F. Gary Eppy, who just as infamously also received Epstein funding. Did you watch my yesterday show, Richard? I didn't, I'm sorry. Okay, because I announced that, uh, I, I, j just for a transparency, because I was talking about a news item about Jeff Epstein, and I announced that, oh, yes, God. Jeff Epstein has once contributed to the start of my YouTube channel with a $25,000 check, and that since then my YouTube channel has kind of taken a different direction, and people were scandalized. They were like, Jeff is an agent of a Jewish millionaire rapist. <laughs> and as it, I he's that person you were joking, I presume. No, no, I'm not joking. Th this is real. Around this time, J.F. Gary Eppie proposed a Nietzschean style post moral paradigm and also published the revolutionary phenotype, which proposed that human replication through a process of artificial assistance and synthetic evolution. Eventually, through this process, DNA based organisms will no longer be the dominant form of life. So to specify for those who don't know me, I'm a moral nihilist. So everything I'm talking about here is not objectively moral truth. It is my preference. If you're going to say like just mere existence is a sort of moral virtue and passing on your genes is a moral value, then couldn't you say like somebody like me who's gotten a vasectomy and chooses not to reproduce, am I committing like an act of genocide against my own species? And is that immoral? Well, I don't think that you're committing a genocide against your own species. You are definitely committing a genocide against your genes. I remember JF speculating that autistic people were the next step in intelligence and that their genes hold the key to creating high IQ people or something to that effect. This explains his choice in women. Well, either that explains it or something much darker does. After all, there's more than one type of payment. Don't, don't say anything violent. No, I won't give it. What do you have to say? No, I get seriously. You try to kill me again. Okay. And I'm fucking sick that you're fucking me with me. You always follow me everywhere. And, all right. <laughs> and you say you want to make spiritual movement, but you fucking tried to kill me for three years again. You're fucking okay. stuck about me. Okay, so the, the answer to the super chat is that Mama JF mistakes no white guilt for someone who has committed acts of violence against her. So that's why you see her currently sad. Mama JF has been the victim of an act of violence. This was not by no white guilt at all. She is confused, and because she is confused, she associates no white guilt with... Okay, now I told her to not come back. You don't come back. So, she has been the victim... It looks like a male, but I have a feeling it's a female, especially it's written in pink. And, um, well, especially looking at the camera at the uh, front of the building, the writing, uh, the person completed the graffiti, wasn't happy about it because they left and came back and put a heart. Maybe they didn't want people to think it was anything not extreme. This explains his choice in women, and Epstein's appreciation of his work. Now look, if Bill Clinton gave me $50,000, I wouldn't turn it down either. I don't think JF was working for Epstein or anything. Correction, he actually seems to be working for Epstein. But I do think Epstein was grooming influencers as per his social prosthetics theory. But mainly, he was grooming biologists. I'm kind of like cooperate to keep a loaded gun under your bed. <laughs> yeah, that'd be me. You are so funny. Too. Cooperate to keep a loaded gun under your bed. In other words, you know, cooperate to watch your back. I find, you know, if you get away from simple A versus B, you get to a situation where it's fine to cooperate, but it, it pays to be cynical. You know, trust and verify. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, something like that. I, I find in the real world, for me, um, maybe outside of kinship relationships, or maybe even with, uh, you have to really kind of 
what's the nuance? You're not going to defect immediately, but you want to keep your running shoes on. Yes, you like that. I often ask myself, how do people really play these games mm -hmm. of cooperation and defection? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we do try to cooperate a lot, but it is not just that we play within this given set of strategies, we try to take actions to minimize our damage. If we would be exploited, you know, it doesn't really hurt me that much. So in some sense, we immediately play around with the rules of the game. And perhaps even more telling is this statement made on the Jeffrey Epstein The Sixth Foundation website announcing the creation of Nero TV for which J.F. Gary Appy had several interviews. Quote, Recently, Jeffrey Epstein The Sixth Foundation, based in the U.S. Virgin Islands, has helped fund Nero TV, the largest online network devoted to academic interviews on everything neuroscience. Nero TV's guest speakers are not run-of-the-mill professors. Two recent guests, May Britt and Edward Moser, directors of the Kavli Institute for Systems Neuroscience, were awarded the 2014 Nobel Prize in Medicine for the discovery of grid cells. Other guests include Hank Greenlee, the director of the Center for Law and the Biosciences, and professor of genetics at the Stanford School of Medicine, Steve Walker from the Snoring Mouthpiece Review, and Sebastian Sung, professor of computational neuroscience at MIT. Neuro TV provides in-depth interview models that delves deeply into science topics such as sleep apnea, Jeffrey Epstein asserted, whose foundation, the Jeffrey Epstein the Sixth Foundation, established the graduate program for evolutionary dynamics at Harvard University in 2003 with a $30 million gift. In addition to establishing the program for evolutionary dynamics, which studies the mathematics of evolution with a focus on diseases, Epstein was a former board member of Harvard's Mind, Body, and Brain Behavior Committee and has funded numerous brain research initiatives at the university. Suddenly, we've gone from secret donor to founding financier. And would you look at that, our missing $30 million reported by the Harvard Crimson has suddenly reappeared. There appears to be some $20 million missing and unaccounted for among this small group of MIT Media Lab lead researchers and founding members. Of course, Epstein's self-aggrandizement isn't entirely to be trusted, but there are grains of truth in it that add more grit to the grasp of her story. Jeffrey Epstein's archived blog shows inside meetings with many of the MIT researchers whom he was funding. It also reaffirms the claim that Jeffrey Epstein founded the program for evolutionary dynamics at Harvard. It continues, quote, Jeffrey Epstein is a former member of the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the New York Academy of Science, and a former Rockefeller University board member. Mr. Epstein is actively involved in the Santa Fe Institute, the Theoretical Biology Initiative at the Institute for Advanced Study, the Quantum Gravity Program at the University of Pennsylvania, and also sits on the Mind, Body, and Behavior Advisory Committee at Harvard. It seems as if this is all leading to something. Of course it was. It was what Jeffrey Epstein told us. His instinctual urge to hold power over others. And there are few other powers ever dreamed of, which are comparable to CRISPR and gene drives. Projects Epstein had close and multitudinous connections to. Here's Jeff with Craig Venter, the first person to sequence the human genome, who operates a project to create synthetic genomes. Uh, we're here today to announce uh, the first uh, synthetic cell, a cell made by uh, starting with the digital code in the computer, uh, building the chromosome uh, from four bottles of chemicals, uh, assembling that chromosome in yeast, transplanting it 
uh, into a recipient bacterial cell and transforming that cell into a new bacterial species. So uh, this is the first self-replicating species that we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. Uh, it also is the first uh, species to have its own website encoded in its genetic code. This has not even been an extensive documentation of all of his academic ties. And, and frankly, not all of the donations are going to be meaningful. But when you look at the meaningful amounts, then a pattern begins to emerge. And as we have seen, the defense and intelligence services are woefully unprepared. Mainly, they have no idea what they're talking about. Their oversight is fractured and their powers are extremely limited. The FBI's strategy right now seems to be to simply trust scientists as being inherently ethical. Uh, sure, happy to. I mean, that really gets to the, the, the crux of um, the, the FBI's uh, um, outreach efforts is that we stand on the premise that um, the scientific community is already in incredibly ethical and responsible. Considering what we've seen today, this strategy seems totally insane. In yet one last demonstration of this fact, I have yet another shocking ethical violation to reveal to you. Yet another Harvard scientist by the name of Charles Lieber chair of the university's Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, was found to be lying to Department of Defense investigators about some rather shady funding. Quote the publication Nature, the charges focus on Lieber's alleged involvement in China's Thousand Talents Plan, a prestigious program designed to recruit leading academics to the country. Documents outlining the charges allege that Lieber received hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Wuhan University of Technology in China and agreed to lead a lab there, and that when U.S. government agencies asked about his involvement with the program, he stated that he was not a participant and denied any formal involvement with the Wuhan University of Technology. Lieber's legal team did not respond to Nature's request for comment. And as the Harvard Crimson writes, federal officials are also investigating Yale University over allegations that the school did not disclose $375 million in foreign funding. Yale filed no reports between 2014 and 2017 according to the journal. We mustn't be caught by surprise by our own advancing technology. This has happened again and again in history. With technology is advanced and this changes social conditions. And suddenly people have found themselves in a situation which they didn't foresee and doing all sorts of things they didn't really want to do. It's imperative that continual oversight is put in place and public awareness is spread about CRISPR devices and their devastating effects. The current lack of public knowledge is akin to a general ignorance of nuclear bombs during the height of the Cold War. If people aren't aware that these things exist, they can't put pressure on lawmakers. It's also plainly evident that our lawmakers are even less suited than the general public to handle these issues. They have consistently struggled with tech issues, often in embarrassing ways. In fact, this is one of Trump's major weaknesses. He has an extremely limited knowledge of biology. And I'm not talking about the disinfectant thing. Uh, to get off topic, saline is a disinfectant. So is peroxide. So is iodine. They're all used internally in surgical procedures. Uh, but back on topic, there might be signs that there is something happening on the biodefense front. In my last video, I showed clips in a stock chart from Gene Drive PLC, which referred to secret Department of Defense contracts that they had and various uses that their mobile genetic screening device had. Uh, in the last six weeks or so, Gene Drive stocks have gone up from nine pounds per share to over 210 pounds in recent days, now settling slightly lower. That is to say that if you had invested $1,000 in the company two months ago, you would now be worth around $20,000. As you can imagine with secret military and government security contracts, further details are a bit thin on the ground. 
I can only hope that we are beginning random screening of samples of any gene therapy or treatment which seeks to alter the genes, and that we are finding safeguards. As much as there is a risk of bioterrorism targeting humans for whatever motive, there is an even more extreme risk for the flora and fauna of the ecosystem. One day you are mutating fruit flies in a lab, the next day there is suddenly a lack of them everywhere around the world. The problem of course is, it has everything it needs to copy itself. And this is, in principle, easy enough to do that a lot of people have the ability to engineer, say, a fruit fly to do this. And if they were to do that and let it, let that fly escape outside, there's a non-trivial chance that it's going to find a mate and most of the offspring are inherit. And, in, and if enough of them survive to mate and their offspring inherit, then it, the odds that it will, by chance, go extinct become low enough that it will eventually spread through the local population around wherever this was released. And then further, by assisted by human transport, all around the world, potentially to every population of that species, whatever that species is. Predator insects that rely on their larvae could go hungry, affecting the bat and bird populations and reduce the overall biological activity which keeps the earth fertile. Carnivorous plants would start to diminish. Uh, fruit might not rot in time to go to seed. There are endless unexpected effects that could uh, happen and come on quickly with one mistake involving one escaped fruit fly. Which is pretty much exactly how we got killer bees. And now humanity's only hope is to play off the killer bees in a turf war with the murder hornets and hope we can finish off the winter while they're still weak. It's interesting how that's suddenly a thing, murder hornets. You'd think we were being economically sabotaged or something. That's everything for now. Remember, Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, but maybe now you've got a good idea uh, as to who did. But that really wasn't enough, right? Because people are going to want to use this. And as long as people want to use this, eventually someone will. That is to say, if it is possible for a small group of scientists to build something that could take a decent crack out of malaria, someone's going to want to be a hero and release it without consulting everyone else. Now, I, I think what, what is going to happen in the future is the dictators will find, as the old saying goes, that you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. But if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the ruled. And this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these... Uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. They will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even. And so making him actually love his slavery. I mean, I think this is the danger, that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime but they will be happy in situations where they oughtn't to be happy.